morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us and for being on time. We have um, a total of about 50 who said they were going to participate, and we're currently, I think, at around 28. And so we're going to start to honor those of you who just have showed up on time. So hi, I'm right now, I'm currently at Avenida's downtown Bryant Street. And just so for all of your information, our our sites are still closed due to the pandemic, but we are starting to have uh, staff think about returning to work and, and planning for that. And we will keep everyone posted through our emails. If you're not a member of Avenida's, I suggest you consider joining because we'll keep you updated on all of our activities and the care forums. And we'll be uh, announcing many more of the, the great activities that are taking place. I am so happy today that we are starting the CARE Forum. We did this in 2019 and we did it in person over at Rose Kleiner Center on a Saturday. And we had anywhere from 40 to 80 people showing up once a month for an in-person series that went on for seven months. And uh, due to the um, wonderful efforts of our donor, we are now starting it again. And this time we have, um, initiated it in view of the pandemic, its impact on our lives, uh, the vaccine rollout and all the difficulties and challenges of being a caregiver or solo ager, um, managing your own health, stress, anxiety. And so uh, doctors Brown and Gattac, my community partners have spent endless hours preparing this next series for us. And I wanna just share with you uh, a word about each of them. So Dr. Ellen Brown is a pioneer in developing the role of the hospice physician in the Bay Area. She has served the community by providing care in the home to thousands of hospice patients. I know personally she honors being able to be in your home and have conversations with families. And she was uh, the medical director of Pathways Hospice. She has trained countless Stanford palliative medicine and geriatrics fellows who now provide care throughout the United States. And she received the Home Care Physician of the Year Award from the California Association of Health Services at Home. So thank you, Ellen, for joining us again. Rita, Dr. Rita Gattac, who I used to work with at Stanford Hospital. So Rita and I were both on staff at Stanford and I would bump into Rita. And Rita um, is the busiest person on earth. She is in every single place at once. She's rather magical about that. It's always amazing that Rita is everywhere at once. It's, it's true, I'm not making that up. So Rita has spent two and a half decades in the field of elder care, pioneering, pioneering programs in dementia care and caregiver support. She is the founder of the Aging and Adult Services Program at Stanford and has worked with thousands of patients in Stanford from 2004 to 2018. She received the Isaac Stein Compassionate Care Award at Stanford and currently is the CEO of a startup, Aging 101, focusing on elder care and innovative care models. And Rita is very involved in task forces and a national conversation on elder care and caregiving. And she's on several boards in our local community. And I do wanna say that um, both Rita and Ellen and I are available for consults. And so our email addresses are posted and you can contact us and we can explain to you what we do for um, private consulting with elders and their families. So doctors Katak and Brown, I'm going to now take, turn my video off and welcome. Thank you, Paula. This wouldn't be possible without you. And thank you to you and Kat for being with us today. We are really grateful to Avanidas for restarting the program. And you know, last time we did it, uh, Dr. Brown and I did it uh, in person, this time from our homes. So it's a different reality today. I just wanted to take a minute and uh, remind you about the last town hall meeting at Avenidas. Dr. Marda Dayati spoke about the, the absolute global impact of the pandemic, the loss of life, the job opportunities, the overall despair, and so much of trauma. He also spoke about the attempts of many entities coming together in the fastest record time for creating the vaccine. So what Dr. Brown and I wanted to do today was take you from that global backdrop to bring a more individualized focus about navigating your health, whether you're an older adult or a caregiver, family member. Both Ellen and I have seen so much this last year. I 
personally lost my father-in-law during the COVID pandemic. And whether it was in with Zoom settings, in homes, or in skilled nursing facilities or in hospitals, this has been a year of shared angst, emotions, but we've also seen the resilience of so many individuals. Ellen? Ellen, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it is certainly so exciting to be launching Care Forum 2021 with both my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gattac, uh, with Paula as moderator, um, and with the, this local community. Um, this series of talks, as uh, has been said, are gonna be for caregivers, solo agers, adult children. And we really are hoping that we can provide practical tips on dealing with this ongoing pandemic, the isolation that followed, and also how to better communicate with your health providers. I know I'm a little bit anxious um, as we begin to emerge from this more than a year of COVID. Um, and, and many of you may be anxious as well. Everyone has their own story to tell and how they dealt with it. Um, and both Rita and I believe it's very helpful to both share data as well as sharing stories as well as strategies that worked. Um, and we will definitely leave time for plenty of questions at the end of the talk. So next slide, please, or sl first slide, please. All right. Actually, I think the first slide is going to be our title slide with both contact information for Dr. Gattac and myself. Um, you can show the title slide, but then we can move on to, um, the, you know, here's the, the, the title about navigating your health during the pandemic and really how we're going to provide practical tips. There is contact information for the three of us, but then the next slide please, with the objectives of what we hope to accomplish today. So, we um, really hope, as I said, that you will be better able to communicate with your health team. Second, we hope today you'll learn some of the consequences of neglecting doctor visits and routine health maintenance. And third, the practical tips um, on how to deal with both the isolation as well as just the pandemic itself. Thank you, Ellen. I think um, as you can look at the objectives and Ellen and I decided to uh, focus on some of these topics because this is what kept coming to us through the pandemic about important information, important needs of our families, caregivers and our older adult patients. I think that so much has changed within the healthcare system. So much has still remained the same and there have been quite a few important ideas and strategies that have come out, whether it's being quoted in journals or in just task forces across the country, even globally about health navigation. Uh, Kat, next slide, please. So who is this talk for? So when Ellen, Paula and I, you know, we spoke to, we have spoken to hundreds of uh, individuals over the last few months and we wanted to you know decide who is this talk for so it's caregivers solo agers and adult children you know i always tell ellen and my colleagues that i have been a caregiver for almost 35 years long distance from my parents in india who passed away and then here right here where i live with my in-laws in fact, as I had mentioned, I lost my father-in-law during the uh, 2020 during COVID. But I would often, you know, stop and never think of myself as a caregiver. Right, Ellen? There is so much confusion about the term caregiver. Many people assume um, that it's a paid or hired caregiver. Um, many 
times I've heard people say, oh, I'm not really a caregiver. And this may come from an adult child or another relative, a friend or a, fa a neighbor. And Rita and I are using a very broad definition of caregiving as anyone who provides a wide range of assistance to someone. This might be personal care. It might be help getting to a doctor, helping with finances, getting groceries, or just simply transportation. So we want to make this a very broad definition. Both Rita and I know that caregiving is not always easy. And the isolation in this past year certainly made caregiving even harder for many of us. Caregivers are often juggling so many roles, employee, spouse, parent, child. And research has certainly shown caregivers are compared to non-caregiver controls. Caregivers have more visits to the their own doctor, more medical expenses, more prescribed medications, higher diastolic blood pressure, higher mortality rates, and poor self-rated health. It's common to feel anger and frustration with themselves or their care recipient. And then sometimes they feel ashamed of their reaction. We hope that through this series of talks over the next six months, we'll provide some tips on how to get help as well as to learn better strategies to ensure many, many things, whether we're talking about smooth transfers from the hospital to home, we're gonna be talking about what's new with dementia care in a future talk um, and brain health, advanced care planning, as well as end of life care. Thank you, Ellen. I think, you know, we talk about the universal laws of caregivers and patient care, but, and with everything that's happened in the pandemic, don't you think, Ellen, that there has been some differences in people's experiences? We know, of course, Rita, we know that certainly not everyone has experienced the same thing with COVID this past year mm -hmm. um, and, and with pandemic depending on whether we live in our own home or assisted living or skilled nursing facility, whether we experienced COVID ourselves or lost a loved one or friend to the disease. Many of us have given up meals with friends or walks, visits with family, even the touch of a family member. Holiday celebrations, stone events of births, death, graduations, so many community rituals migrate Zoom this past year. And this certainly has been, what a year this has been. Uh, and uh, we're just beginning to emerge from this. Thank you. We've also, so many facilities, whether they be assisted living or skilled nursing facilities, they were designed to prevent isolation. But now, or at least the last year, they did everything they could to enforce it. There was a loss of control of one's life in exchange for more safety. But we've also witnessed this past year the amazing resilience of older adults and caregivers. They lived through it. You know, and the pandemic has created a new normal as you and I see every day. And when we talk to our colleagues, nationally as well. So when you look at wellness, illness, clinic, home to hospital and back, slowly Ellen services are opening up as we are seeing. In a recent poll though in the Bay Area especially, when you look at all the clinics and hospitals and providers, uh, it is determined that at least 15 to 20 percent, if not more, will continue as virtual. So even though things will change, but not everything. And Many of us have become accustomed to this way of life, the sense of security in just staying home, not uh, branching out too much. But given our daily interactions with patients and caregivers, I'm also amazed at the creativity around me. Every day I'm listening to different creative options where caregivers themselves are telling me whether it's paid caregivers or family caregivers about new 
you know, strategies they are using for communicating for better health. And we will be bringing these to you through the course of these talks. So many different technology apps have emerged, bringing people together, programming, shopping, transportation, even in-home monitoring. Ellen and I, you and I are part of some strategies for that exactly. Um, and uh, next slide, please, Kat. So we're going to shift now to talking about your health and your symptoms. But before I actually get started in, the, in sort of the meat of this topic, I want to say that by now, hopefully everyone on this Zoom session has talked to your own health provider about the vaccine and has been able to obtain one if you want one. It's always important to discuss your specific situation with your own health provider. Um, and we're not going to talk today about specific vaccines, pros and cons and different ones, but Avenidas has plenty of information about the specific of vaccines and we can always make that available to you. I'm gonna be talking about general health care and health maintenance issues. Um, we know now after this year, some of the consequences of avoiding our own health care and health maintenance during the pandemic. Hopefully these will be challenges of the past. Um, fears of catching the virus are really giving way to more and more people making appointments, scheduling visits with the dentist, getting their blood work and their routine care. However, doctors have reported there certainly was decreased medical testing during the pandemic. One study looked at six common cancers and found that the weekly number of identified new cancer patients decreased almost 50% in 2020 uh, during the, after the pandemic compare, compared to the same time in 2019. Screening tests for cervical, colon, and breast cancer decreased more than 80% in spring 2020 compared to the last several years. According to the National Cancer Institute, the US is likely to see around 10,000 excess deaths from breast and colorectal cancer in the next decade because of pandemic related delays in screening and treatment. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. Many people were afraid to go in, in the, during you know, the early part of the pandemic, and many hospitals and clinics were postponing screenings and routine care because they were overwhelmed with COVID patients uh, during the early part of the pandemic. However, I wanna reassure people, now more than one year later, medical facilities know how to keep people safe. Thank you, Ellen. These are great insights. And I think that what you said about the cancer diagnosis and medical studies are showing that there have been a great number of heart-related crises and heart attacks, mainly due to delayed visits with doctors, fear of the ER, lack of follow-up, or simply delays in routine care. This pandemic has led many people to forego follow-up treatment, just routine screening, chronic health conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes management, even physical therapy and other preventive measures. Many have pushed back on routine matters. You know, Ellen, I recall the case of a caregiver I worked with a few months ago, and I've been working with her with regards to her own parents. She's in her early 60s, and she refused to go to a physical routine test just because she was overwhelmed with the pandemic, taking care of her mother, looking at all other aspects of life. Most of the time was spent about worrying about all of these and this caused significant delays. Yeah, Rita, you are so right. I, yeah, it's not only cancer, heart conditions and so many other chronic conditions um, might've been ignored during the pandemic but I cannot emphasize enough about talking to your own health provider about what health screenings are important for your care. You know, it's very different than when I was in training when there were more blanket recommendations that if you're this age, you should get this test. Um, 
there are no more blanket recommenda recommendations for health maintenance. It's very much geared to individual decisions based on your situation. What other diseases do you have? Um, what is your functional status? Uh, what is your life expectancy? Many of them are tied to if you need to have at least a five-year life expectancy for this test to be important. So as I said, it, this is a discussion that has to happen between an individual and their doctor. Um, in addition, your symptoms matter and don't ignore them. You know, if you're unusually tired or experiencing a new pain or blood in your bowel movements, um, talk to your health provider. You can always start with a virtual, you know, with a telephone call, a virtual visit, and then a decision about what needs to happen next. If you see unexplained bumps, bruises, and lesions, make that call or appointment with your doctor. Um, it's important to talk with them about what can be taken care of virtually and what can be postponed. Um, for example, something as simple as blood pressure checks can certainly be done at the home uh, and then sent to your provider. If you have a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, or stroke, you may be at risk for another stroke and monitoring your blood pressure in the home can be extremely helpful in managing that risk. It's similar to the, uh, in, uh, the um, caregiver you were talking about before, Rita. I think this is, this is a great example and example that you've given because when I go back to the caregiver that I was working with, um, you know, I realized that I picked up on it simply because I was talking to her and recognizing that there was physical distress and emotional stress, and she was not really adhering to her care compliance or her routine visits or the screening. And I think that in this particular instance also, and then like, the, like you just mentioned, there was a combined risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. And honestly, we were able to work together as a team and you know, prevent a grim consequence because we were able to talk her into taking action. And that's the important piece that with so much going on, you know, we are not making our health a priority or the symptoms, you know, what is going on because so much has changed. I am also noting, Ellen, one more, um, you know, one more aspect of healthcare, which I did not see so much before, were these facilitated conversations that were that are happening more and more in my practice, where conversations between an adult daughter, the older adult himself or herself, the paid caregiver, and even the providers. And we will talk about this soon. During these times when clinic visits are reduced, some of the follow-up action and care coordination becomes even more important. And I think this is something you and I are noting. Um, Pat, next slide, please. You're right, virtual visits um, with health providers became much more common with COVID. Um, and as Re Rita mentioned earlier, they are not going away. They're going to become a part of our new normal. Um, one of the things that enabled uh, this increase in telehealth visits was that Medicare suddenly um, began paying physicians if they had telehealth visits. In the past, it was almost impossible to get reimbursed by Medicare, but because of the difficulty in getting into the doctor's offices, because um, there was such a need for telehealth visits during the pandemic, Medicare said, did say to providers, okay, we will reimburse you. So, and Although reimbursement on an emergency provision, again, that's not likely to go away completely. In some circumstances, there are very real advantages to a telemedicine or telehealth visit. Um, there certainly may have been a lot of hesitancy in the beginning or lack of experience or just not even sure how to set it up. But telehealth has become more commonplace um, and over time easier to manage. There are even many practices that will send someone to a person's home to make sure it's uh, set up or equipped for a telehealth visit. And so much is possible. Visits with patients uh, who have a hard time getting to the doctor's office 
either because of where they live or because of just uh, functional limitations, getting into a car and getting to the office. Um, family meetings that could occur with family members located all across the country who weren't able to come in person, but via telemedicine can all be a participant in these critical conversations. And then again, meetings where multiple physicians or providers can be on the call, where it might've been hard to get everyone in one room, but they can you know, set aside time in their day for a telehealth visit. Um, there are some things that are managed very well with a virtual visit. This can be a follow-up of a chronic condition, including diabetes, high blood pressure, or COPD. It could be a review of lab tests or counseling about uh, the next steps to take. Rashes and skin conditions often lend themselves very well to a virtual visit. It can be looked at very quickly with telehealth. On the other hand, there are certain things that don't do very well with telehealth. Eye complaints where somebody really needs to examine your eye in person may not um, be handled as quickly via telehealth. Abdominal pain or other conditions where a doctor um, or health provider really needs to examine the person in person um, may require an in-person visit. Um, and in, of course, if you, patient or caregiver really insist on wanting an in-person visit with a physician or a health provider, uh, they should accommodate you. The, um, here are some tips um, on how to uh, prepare for a telehealth visit with your doctor. Um, because again, this I'm sure was very new for most of us. Uh, and while, during the pandemic, uh, there have been some reports that as much as 75, 80% of visits were handled virtually. Um, uh, prior to the pandemic, that number was about five to 10%. So this was new for physicians, nurse practitioners, um, as well as for patients. So here are some uh, helpful tips. Have your questions written down prior to the session. Uh, if you have your own blood pressure monitor, bring your readings to the session. Have your complete list of medications written down to share with your provider, especially if you see multiple providers and they may not all be sharing this information with one another. They may not be part of the same health system. Have the facts written down about what is going on with very specific information. For example, I have a dry cough that started five days ago. Um, and of course, be prepared for technological glitches. There might be issues with volume or freezing or muting or voice delay. Um, know, have a number on hand and know who to contact if these glitches occur and interfere with the, um, with the visit. As every uh, health provider encounter, whether it's in person or virtual, it's always important to understand what um, the, the doctor or health provider is saying and keep asking questions until you do. I've heard from um, many people, even family members saying they don't wanna ask the doctor a question. They don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna question their authority. And I always say, ask the question. It's so important when you end a virtual encounter, leave a physician's office, that you understand the recommendations and know what to expect, what's coming next. And doctors expect your questions. One of the ways I usually end a patient encounter is to simply have them um, relate back to me what their understanding is of what I've just said uh, and make sure we're on the same page. Give them an opportunity to, you know, what other questions do you have? But really 
make sure that what that I think the person understands what I think I'm meaning to uh, what I've meant to tell them. Um, it's also very important to know um, the health portal your doctor is using. Um, it's often a good way to communicate between visits. Um, and then certainly an important piece of information is to find out what uh, what the best way to communicate, um, or the best way to get questions to your health provider uh, so that you can get the answers back as quickly as possible. Great. You know, this is such an important area, Ellen. In fact, it's something that I'm constantly talking about to whether it's, you know, healthcare agencies or family members. And I think that what I have started advising lately is to write a thoughtful letter to the physician through my health. I know my health only gives you a, a you know, little bit of space to do so, but it is important to be able to outline. I recall this um, individual that I've been working with and uh, she's you know, barely in her 80s and she's just um, you know, like us experiencing the new normal of the pandemic, uh, postponing some of her screening, running into some difficulties. And she felt that she just wasn't able to communicate uh, with the physician over these telehealth uh, Zoom meetings or even occasional in-person meetings. So I asked her to just write down what her priorities were and explain to her what she was feeling. You know, she had some concerns about some symptoms and felt that um, her family was sort of uh, not really responding to her needs and so on. So she wrote this really thoughtful few lines and that opened up a great portal of communication between her and her physician. So the coming back to your earlier point as well, that there has been a surge in this virtual healthcare, the telehealth services, nurse hotlines, video conferencing, remote patient monitoring. So there has been this shift that we've seen and it is so important to remember that it is working well, but it still does not replace the touch of the provider, face-to-face the -face meeting, you know, the ability to be with each other in person. So a lot of coaching is happening. And I think that we want our audience today to know that there has been so much effort that people like you and I are involved, but many of our are involved in making sure that healthcare providers and systems are able to recognize what caregivers and adult, older adults are going through. However, one important point, Ellen, that keeps coming up is that what's an escalation? You know, what can we count on to, to be able to do successfully on telehealth versus a sudden escalation? What's a sudden escalation? How do we identify? And, and what happens? And what's the, what's the proper response to that? Yeah, exactly, Rita. If it is being serious, a critical health situation, and if your wishes are to be managed or treated in the hospital, then telehealth may not be the best option. However, if your wish is to not go to the hospital and to be managed comfortably at home, even if it is a serious illness, um, palliative care teams are very able to use telemedicine successfully and they can manage symptoms at home if that is your desire. And this can be a wonderful option for people who prefer to stay home. And we should also say that we are very fortunate in the Bay Area, just in our access to broadband. You know, unfortunately, when they've looked across the country, only 5% of seniors actually have access to broadband, which made telehealth in other parts of the country very difficult. In this area, that's um, the number is much higher in terms of having access to the equipment necessary for telehealth. But what is your experience, Rita? I know you have so, also had a lot of evidence. Exactly, and I think that in the last few months, Ellen, what has been really hard is because I've been on the long-term task, uh, long-term care task force. So I've been able to actually intervene with many patients who've been in these assisted living or long-term care facilities. And you know the fact that the adult daughter or the family member cannot visit so even to have a telehealth, the child, the adult child or the another person is not present to facilitate, but you know, staff members have been able to do that. So that has happened. 
But another point that I have seen is that, you know, which has become quite helpful is getting multiple people on that call. So that it does take, and I wanted to explain this to our audience as well, that ask for it, you know, for example, and I'm going to give you a case study because I always believe a case study can demonstrate, you know, an, an, an example uh, better. So I remember working with this individual who lives alone and, you know, for the most part done pretty well during the pandemic, has been able to use some of the technology apps for basic services and, you know, been very, very socially engaged on, on telehealth or, or Zoom. Anyway, he had a fall and he was hospitalized. And it was, of course, that's another part I want to talk about, you know, being in a hospital setting during this time. But then he was taken to a skilled nursing facility. And uh, coming back home, it was hard to, again, arrange for going for another subsequent x-ray and going back to the doctor's offices. So we had a, a kind of a conference call and the doctor wanted to see the healing. So an x-ray technician came to the home. We were able to arrange for a Zoom call, not just with the primary care provider, but also for the orthopedic doctor and the care coordinator from the agency who was you know, care coordinating all of this. This was very helpful, Ellen, because all of us were on this uh, call. We were able to itemize what he needed in real time, you know, in terms of um, next steps to follow up, physical therapy, what else needed to be done. However, this kind of effort takes a great deal of planning, precision, but we were able to coach the family members and caregivers. So I think a part of our work that's happening right now is really trying to adapt all our systems into you know, working effectively during this pandemic. I think it's, it's not new, but it, it does take a lot of effort in doing these virtual visits. And then, you know, sure. health is helping with uh, checklists. Uh, we've been able to develop, and I think it's, it's available in most uh, uh, forums is these home assessment checklists, virtual tours, almost like doing a home visit. I mean, Ellen, you and I have always done home visits our entire professional life. I mean, I remember um, really excited about home visits because you get to see the person, you get to see, can this patient really provide that kind of care compliance, what's happening, safety and all of that. So that has been really good to do. And what are your thoughts on these virtual assessments, home assessments. It, you know, it is great to be able to do a virtual home assessment. And I second you said, one of the best parts of my job were making home visits or house calls. Um, you know, I've been doing them for more than 20 years and uh, you so much vital information um, by assessing the home. Uh, whether it's assessing gait and mobility, how well does, can the person walk in their own home? Uh, are they isolated within the home? Um, what is their taking medications? And even who they are as a person, what, um, the, the, you know, you can get a better sense of the support of faith, of their hobbies, of who this person really is. And that uh, improves the relationship between a doctor and a patient. So, Virtually, you are able to do somewhat of a limited home assessment. And of course, it's always important to check with the patient if that's okay, because you want to uh, respect the pri their privacy. Um, so you can ask if it's okay to survey the home during a virtual visit. But it does, um, telemedicine can give you an eye into the home uh, to establish a connection to, uh, as I said, get some important information. You know, and Ellen, the other area of this telehealth has also been family meetings. I mean, you and I and Paula, we've always believed in the efficacy of family meetings because there's nothing more wonderful than coming together to decide what are the goals, whether it's advanced care planning or how to manage the here and now. And I want to go back to the caregiver that I first mentioned, the, um, the person that was having difficulties in just managing her own health because she was prioritizing everything else. And I recall in this case, we were able to have a very successful family meeting. 
And I think what it did was that it was, you know, that was such a great forum, Ellen, where she was able to speak up and say, well, I've been told I've been neglecting my health. I haven't been putting my symptoms on the forefront, but I need help. I need someone else to step in. I need someone else to kind of take some of the responsibilities. So those kind of meetings, whether it's the care of the older adult, the complexities of care, making important decisions about advanced care planning, just coordinating a care plan. You do this, I do this, all of these things. So family meetings I've been able to conduct pretty successfully over Zoom and more and more providers in all health systems are now finding that given the pandemic, given the isolation, it's often a great idea to have a family meeting to make sure what are we missing? What can we do? You know, this is something that we are advocating to our uh, patients and family members. And so in these cases, um, you know, a tool that you and I have been using for almost two and a half decades is, is you know, it is still very practical right now. So I want to summarize before we move on to the topic uh, away from telemedicine. Um, so there really have been great strides in both audio and visual technology with now than when it started a year ago. Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, there's been improvement in in-home patient monitoring. Uh, there's been some reduction of transportation difficulties in getting to the doctor. Um, these are good steps, but health providers need to continuously work on making it better, making it simpler to use. Um, we encourage caregivers to keep asking questions until you get the answers you need. And using My Health, as we said, our health portal as an effective way to communicate between visits. And that can um, uh, allow adult children and caregivers to step in with permission to use these health portals. Right. And, you know, the, one of the task forces that I've been on, Ellen, has been looking into also this, this uh, particular topic of, you know, um, being empowered to be on these health portals. Sometimes if an older adult is unable to do so, or if a spouse cannot, but you're so, so right. Informed consent, the ethics of obtaining permission, respecting the autonomy. But it is becoming very important that if there are test results being posted on a portal and the provider is not able to reach you, that if there is someone else that can, that can actually access those and then work on it. So these are all, you know, Ellen, when I think about it, so many aspects of uh, client um, uh, permission, informed consent, making sure we are doing the right thing, but we are all learning as we navigate this space in the pandemic, we are learning. And uh, next slide, please. So prior to the pandemic that, you know, I, I remember Care Forum 2019, Ellen, that you and Paula and I conducted, we spent a lot of time talking about family dynamics and the ever shifting and juggling roles of older adults. I mean, I think of myself as this person because I think all my life I've juggled between my work and you know my daughter and, um, and elder care. My first, it was my mother-in-law who passed away with aggressive breast cancer. And then you know, and during the pandemic, my father-in-law. But it is so important to remember that you know, we are human and that these, these aspects of these dynamics, they have to be, they have to be confronted, they have to be recognized, they have to be talked about, because honestly, Ellen, that determines the care. I mean, I've seen that in myself, that there have been so many times where I've not been able to, um, you know, figure out what to do because of the, the pressures of, of caregiving. So I think that's something that you and I will talk about in the next session more, but we are looking at the pandemic making this harder to manage. Don't you agree? Uh, we've seen so many times where family members are not allowed to even be in the hospital um, with their loved one, whether it's in the emergency room or an inpatient setting, or more important when it's time for discharge. And there's so much that has to go into discharge. And caregiver, family member, adult children aren't allowed in the room COVID because of strict visitor policies. Um, so isolation 
due to COVID has certainly made um, hospitalizations harder. Right. And, you know, I, I, I have been going to the hospital back now because of the change, some changes, some relaxation, but it is an entirely different uh, situation right now. Discharging someone when your loved one is not within the hospital setting has opened up so many other um, aspects that, that you know, uh, are, are very difficult to manage. So there is this, um, on one hand, Ellen, as you said, the pandemic has rendered us extremely vulnerable and the inpatient providers have limited abilities to have these conversations and handoffs. And uh, I think this is something that you and I are going to be addressing on a subsequent topic because I do believe this is a very important topic and it is, it is impacting recovery and care next steps. So I think this is something that you and I will be discussing next. Um, yeah, I mean, health providers need to ask better questions of caregivers to help them assess the situation. Um, it's important to ask about caregiver health. Are they going to be able to do, to do what's required when the person comes home? Um, we need to help caregivers assess their own health concerns and lifestyle challenges. Um, but you know, we're gonna talk about this a lot in the next session, how the caregivers are really part of the unit of care and providers need to know the questions to ask to get the information. Is this gonna be a safe, stable situation that the person is going home to? Is the caregiver gonna be able to manage or should they have to manage this? You know, what, what's going on? Right. I wanted to give you a quick glimpse of my last um, encounter in the in the hospital setting. This is so different. This is so different from anything else that was there prior to the uh, pandemic. Now, if you look at a hospital system, it's a, it's an acute facility, and you have tests going on, teams coming in, and uh, you know so many discussions happening. Now, you look at the adult child, or you look at somebody else outside of the hospital that's trying to plan or just trying to find out what's happening, it makes it very hard. And oftentimes the iPhone next to the patient, you know, they may not be able to get to it. So we have some ideas that we are coaching families about making sure that you're writing down your questions and finding a time whereby you can page the medical team, page the social worker, discharge planner, ask those routine questions because otherwise in this, without this kind of a backdrop where you're not physically there, it becomes very hard. So proactive discussion, again, something that is happening and we are helping with these discussions and that's, that's moving forward. So um, Ellen, you also wanted to say something more about the isolation and you know uh, how it's getting, it, it is harder. I, I wanted to even say, you know, about the importance of getting your questions to the health provider when you can't physically be in the hospital, you know, whether it's faxing your questions over or um, uh, calling, leaving your questions with the nursing unit to um, finding a time because, you know, it used to be you could stay by the bedside, as you said, Rita. And so we've uh, got to be quite clever and proactive in how to get your questions across. Um, and I wanted to mention a little bit uh, different way about how isolation has made things harder. Um, uh, and this was a totally different experience, but this is when someone I, I would get a number of phone calls um, because people wanted to stay home and not go to the hospital, but wanted to make sure that during COVID, during the pandemic, this um, uh, was a viable solution. You know, could things be taken care of in the home? Um, and they would say, you know, I've, this was somebody usually with serious illness. Um, and they'd say, I thought about it. I thought about my life wishes. Um, I don't want to be the, in, in the hospital and die alone and not have any family or, around. Um, so while for some people, the hospital may be the desired place of treatment, it isn't for everyone. Um, and doctors and caregivers won't know, you know, they answer you know, to the question uh, unless they ask, you know, where do you want to receive your treatment? Um, if someone has decided to remain at home, and this was especially true during um, the pandemic, where it was difficult to visit 
Um, many people had been dying alone in an ICU or a hospital. I, I would discuss with the patient or the family um, how to arrange for the clinical team to make sure the person could be comfortable at home as well as discuss what medications they might need in the home for comfort. Um, and this always happened before the pandemic, but there were some extra steps, some proactive planning to make sure we could arrange for everything that needed to be done, whether it was uh, via telemedicine, whether it was the extra steps to get the medications in the home. Um, but if this was someone's wishes to make sure they could stay at home and be comfortable at home. And so that was just a, a different situation um, about thinking about things a little bit differently during the pandemic. And you wanted to also touch on the isolation about mental health. Yes, and certainly, um, I think as many people may be aware, um, how isolation affects mental health, whether it's how we grieve or bereavement, um, uh, there may have been loss of income. There may, uh, the fear and anxiety uh, that was so present over the last year uh, may have triggered mental health conditions or exacerbated existing ones. Um, and many people were facing increased sadness, anxiety. There may have been, there, we know there has been some increase in alcohol and drug use. Uh, the grieving alone without support of family and friends. Um, and we, we also know that people with mental health conditions or substance use disorders um, may have been more vulnerable to infections from COVID um, and may have had a higher risk of severe outcome. Uh, so I, Rita, you were gonna talk about some tips on how to deal with some of these mental health issues that certainly arose during isolation. Right. We've seen an upsurge in research, Ellen, in the journals and the, and the latest that's going around is that there has been actually a huge uprise in terms of the feelings of fear, anger, sadness, worry, numbness, frustration, everything that you just talked about, the changes in appetite, energy. It is, it is honestly, it is kind of a, a life-changing experience that we've all had, physical reactions, headaches, etc. Now, there are some tips that have come through and in, my, in the course of my uh, at least eight or nine months of active participation in the COVID task force, we've learned about some things that have been helpful. Um, th this is, of course, data still being collected and most of these are very common sense practical tips, but it's about, you know, it's okay to listen to some of the news, but just take a break from it constantly watching and reading and listening to news stories. Social media has had a neg negative impact on many. Um, taking care of your body, all the things that we knew were important. Deep breathing, stretching, eating healthy, well-balanced meals, exercise, sleep, um, just social socialization, just learning to enjoy some of the normal things, avoiding excessive alcohol, tobacco, substance use, all of these become really important tips, Ellen. You know, there is a particular community that has now, it's a, it's a retirement community, and they've seen so much of sadness in their older adults that they have now decided to take this as a practical, kind of a daily information, a daily messaging about making sure that we are doing all of these things to get through and, and get back to some kind of a, you know, a normalcy. Um, and I think that, also, not only taking care of yourself, it helps you better equip, equip to take care of others. At times of social distancing, it is so important to stay connected with friends and family and just making that extra effort to reach out. Avenidas has so much of resources and social support systems. Our Paula conducts these amazing support groups where people come together. So, you know, these are, these are really important. Um, uh, next slide, please. I think we're pretty much coming to the end. We have just one more slide and then we'll stop and take questions. Um, go ahead. Um, right. and, and Rita, I'm also thinking it's possible our last slide, since we're gonna be talking so much about it in the second session, we may, we'll see how we do with, uh, sure, with sure, that. Sure. Um, 
So we wanted to shift a little bit uh, and spend some time talking about skilled nursing facilities and what was different in the past year. Uh, certainly one of the most difficult decisions people face um, is deciding on placement of a loved one in a skilled nursing facility or even which one to choose. Um, and this was made even more difficult during the pandemic. Um, and Rita and I will talk about uh, making informed decisions. Um, one of, certainly one of the concerns in the past year uh, was family members saying the inability to visit. In fact, many people made the decision to bring someone home from a facility um, due to this because of COVID. Um, however, now with most nursing home residents being vaccinated um, and, and the staff and back in nursing homes being vaccinated, there has been some relaxation on visiting policies and somewhat lessening of the isolation. I think there are two aspects of this, Ellen, as you know, and I think most of our audience knows that as well, that you could be already living in an assisted living or in a long-term bed in a skilled nursing facility, or you will go to a skilled nursing visit, a, a skilled nursing facility after a hospital stay, whether it's an orthopedic a fracture or a cardiac matter. And I think that this is now coming up. In fact, I get so many questions on a, you know, very regular basis about what should we do? Should we go to, should we take our loved one to a skilled nursing facility or should we make sure that we are um, taking them home and managing, uh, managing matters there? I think those are always important questions, uh, how to manage that. And, um, you know, you had mentioned about um, the, the short-term and the long-term uh, effects of the skilled nursing facilities. So one of the facts that I've, I'm noticing is that when we do talk about these skilled nursing facilities, many individuals, Ellen, want to go to a authorized uh, site to find out what the, uh, are there any citations? What's their COVID policy? How many staff members? How many infections? So these are important data that's available. You can always make a call, have a virtual tour of the skilled nursing facility. And the other point is that, you know, how much information can you actually get by speaking or what's the level of comfort you can get you know, by talking to these uh, to the individuals in the skilled nursing facilities? Go ahead, Ellen. Um, you're right. I, the, um, uh, having the conversations, even though you can't be there in person to look at the facility, virtual visits are important. Um, getting a, a, you know, both looking at the data about the facility and citations, but also getting a feel. Uh, is this facility going to work for my loved one? Um, we've also talked about a question that's come out, come up a lot recently. Uh, is um, do they have to go to a skilled nursing facility, uh, or can I manage uh, uh, the, at home? Um, and I know you've worked with families. I've certainly worked with families who were determined to make it work for their loved one to come home instead of going to a nursing facility. Um, but it requires such careful coordination between the hospital, the healthcare team, usually a home care team, um, as well as caregivers really looking realistically, can, you know, what care is needed and can they provide it at home? Um, what's your experience with that, Rita? Yeah, and in fact, Ellen, I have a personal story because, um, you know, we tried to not take my father-in-law to a skilled nursing facility and try to manage the care at home. It had, it had its huge set of uh, disadvantages and advantages, but I think it's a question of having the primary care doctor, the discharging physician, what is the equipment needed, the medication, the, uh, the uh, care, as you said, all of that comes together, and I think this is something that I would really like to spend a little bit more time, and I know you and I had talked about discussing this uh, in, in, a, in a later setting, about creating that kind of a skilled nursing facility infrastructure within a home setting. At one point, um, Ellen, I wanted to also say, I know in the, in the slideshow I'd written the word advocacy, is that Remember, you are the biggest advocate for your loved one in a skilled nursing facility. Calling the team members, having these informed meetings, uh, doing these kind of Zoom calls with them, even the iPad, using an iPad. I have patients and families that will use the iPad to speak with the loved one along with the team, monitoring the progress, making sure nothing is missed. So even though we are not touching and feeling and 
holding the person or getting close to the person. There are many ways you can be the uh, you can be the advocate. Plus, there are also the other you know sort of the more professional channels. If you notice something is happening, calling those to make sure that the care is being provided. Um, I think Ellen. Um, Long-term care facilities are making a lot of rapid changes. Some of the bills still haven't been passed, but a lot has happened in the last few months to make sure that the care is better. That we are not having, you know, other acute infections, and and staff is being monitored and so on. Right. They're looking at acute infections. They're looking at falls. They're looking sure, at staff sure. ratios, and that there's always an ombudsman at the facility if you know right. to bring a formal uh, concern to. But you're right. Um, family members and caregivers can be the best advocate someone can have. Um, and next slide. I know, Ellen, you mentioned that maybe we, um, we don't want to spend a whole, a whole lot of time on this because this is going to be the next talk, but we want to discuss a few ideas and we can open up to, you know, questions as, you, as we want. To. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But this is the last slide and we'll be finishing up and, and we'll be um, talking much more about the role of caregivers uh, and, and health providers um, and how that's beginning to change. Um, many caregivers report uh, not getting enough support from health professionals. Some of them report feeling abandoned by the healthcare system. And to be honest, the healthcare system has not always recognized caregivers, but this is starting to change and for very good reason. Um, caregivers want recognition and validation of the role you are playing, and you should have that recognition. It is a huge role. Um, caregivers should insist on being included as part of the healthcare team. And what that means is that then you're included in the medical record as part of the healthcare team. Um, and then you should be getting questions about what your responsibilities are as caregivers. What are you actually doing for the, you know, the, the care recipient? Um, what, does, you know, what does the person actually need and what are you providing? Um, it, you, the caregivers should be provided with helpful information about um, the care recipient or loved one's disease and the expected progression of this disease. Important to know what to expect. And then certainly ongoing education on how to be a better caregiver, how to do certain things better um, has been shown to be extremely helpful for caregiver health. So we are gonna expand on these um, thought in session two, uh, but um, wanted to, provide sort of a, just a little outline or overview. And Ellen, as you know, you and I have often talked about it that I'm on this exciting uh, uh, group of uh, tasks where we are looking at, you know, how, you know, as the, the, as the older adults uh, lifestyle and changes happen, the caregiver's life also changes. So it's not just a change in the, in your loved one. It's like how you are changing. So we are doing some exciting research on this. In fact, our, Hopefully our book is gonna come out soon as well. So, but it is, it is an important time to discuss what it means to be a caregiver. And um, so we are um, excited to have been on this forum and thank you so much Paula for making this possible and all of Avenida's and Kat and we are open to questions. Now I do understand that there may be some questions we may not be able to always answer, but Paula, we hope that you will, you know, send it our way and if we can assist with anything we'll be happy right okay. i think i just want to say we we are uh, want to highlight the importance of caregivers um to the healthcare system and hope this was a start to the conversation but are really looking forward uh, uh future sessions to expanding on that so thank you okay can you hear me yes, yes. okay i can't see me um so we, okay, there we go. Hi, thank you so much. That was so informative. And um, I have a lot, I always have a lot of questions, even though I've been <laughs> working in this for 30 years. But so Jean wanted, asked a question about the telemedicine system. She said she was having problems and difficulties and just gave up, gave up an appointment she couldn't get through. And she wanted to know um, if there are any particular systems you recommend or how to navigate this. 
so the thing I want to say is I don't have particular systems to recommend, but I can tell you there are um, medical schools now have division on digital health and telehealth, and that they are exploring which ones are better, which ones are easier to manage. Um, I know the palliative care team at UCSF sends a team into your home to make sure people can manage it and it's simpler. So they're, they're working on it, but I don't have specific platforms, but I agree that some of them are really complicated and make it difficult. Um, and so some doctors were originally just using phone calls. Um, however, that you know, may go away. They're, they're trying to come up with simpler ones to use that use both visual and audio. So Jean, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific platform. Rita, do you have one? I think that I, I agree with you, Ellen, but I've also had uh, family members say the exact thing to me that they couldn't, it was not easy. So in that case, what I've done is I've actually been on the call to the nurse practitioner or the assistant of the physician and I've asked, you know, what is it that's going to help? Because sometimes the laptop isn't enough. Sometimes having a, you know, if it's in a facility, getting somebody else to bring an iPad in to sync it, sometimes having an iPhone call. So there are multiple options. We are learning on this, but it has to be customized to the person, I believe. So I think in this case, if Jean is having difficulty, has she actually uh, spoken to the assistant of the physician to see what can be done, what maybe even for the for one time only, bring somebody in to help you. So there are many options that are available right now, but we're also happy to research some and get back to her. Okay, I do know, and it's a recommendation that um, for everybody who's on as a caregiver and involved, that you wanna make sure you have informed consent to speak directly to the care provider. So you could call in and say, I'm having problems, or you can, if you have your loved one's account code, like or Stutter or Kaiser, then you can write a letter and explain what is happening for you. Or you just simply call the advice line that day or the day ahead to make sure things are, are set up properly. And then you can also um, retain, if you can, an elder care director, care manager, or helper, or consultant to be with you on the calls. Because I'm, what I'm hearing from Ellen and Rita is that that's what the, partly what they've been doing during the pandemic is they have participated on these calls with their clients, which makes a huge difference. Uh, but uh, Paula, I want to highlight what you said is that it, especially during these times, it's really important for either adult children or caregivers to get that informed consent from um, the care recipient to be part of these calls, to have access to the record. Um, and, and most times it's freely given, but without that, can't include them. Right. So, so informed consent and durable powers of attorney, I know, confuse people. Informed consent is very simple. Your loved one needs to sign on, sign your name to their medical records and just simply give you informed consent. That's, that's easy to do. But if they're already at the point of being confused and declared as such, then it becomes more difficult and you need to have the advanced health care directive and a durable power of attorney in order to do that. So in some cases, if you've known the doctors for a long time, they may not ask for that. Rita, we have two questions for you. Uh, Will, who... Uh, is a member of the Avenida's Village and our caregiver group. He um, has worked with Stanford Aging and Adult Services previously, previously, and now wants to know what is the difference between what uh, Stanford's Adult and Aging Services is doing currently, and then what your your service, Aging 101, what do you do now that okay. uh, you, you are on your own? <laughs> so. So very briefly, um, I'm happy to take this offline as well, but Aging Adult Services was something I started many, many years ago, which is really more of a, a program which looks at the big picture and has multiple programs under it, memory support and care coordinations and so on. Um, I actually um, left Stanford a couple of years ago to finish that particular task. And now I have started Aging 101, which is really a platform where people like Ellen, myself, and geriatricians and others help individuals navigate the path, exactly what we are talking about. So whether it's from wellness to illness, um, handling difficult questions, the family meetings, just chronic care. So these are two different entities. Um, and Aging Adult Services exists exactly like it was. It's got a great team. And um, it's sort of the, uh, you know, the wellness to illness kind of a 
Okay. Um, people are asking for your contact information. So um, it was on the, the opening slide, but we're going to post it again in the chat line. And then people are welcome to contact me at Avenidas, and I can also uh, sure. provide your um, information. I want to go back to the a question about mental health services, what we've learned ironically from this whole year where so many of us had felt depressed and anxious and were isolated. And we, we also felt that we had no one we could talk to. And then when we did get a hold of our providers, we were told, and I'm being told by my caregivers now, that there's a three to almost six month delay because there's so many people who need support for anxiety, for depression. Um, people are having digestive problems. I got a call yesterday for somebody who needs a psychiatrist or a mental health therapist because it's both her body and her mind now, and she can't find anybody. So she is looking for this particular person. A lot of us are looking for private therapists who accept Medicare, mental health therapists who accept Medicare. And um, I'm wondering if that's something, a list maybe during the course of the care forum, we can, we can create that because it's very hard to um, find these individual therapists. And I know the Stanford Outpatient Department of Psychiatry offers mental health help, but just wouldn't have to be referred from a Stanford physician. That's, that's my question. Or resources, if you have resources for this. It's so interesting, um, Paula, you said this because just two days ago, I was compiling a list of uh, uh, you know, providers who do take Medicare. And I remember that I have nine names. I'm happy to send them to you. You can make it available. However, out of these names, I think about four of them that I called have absolutely zero availability. So you are absolutely right. I mean, I know that referrals, whether it's whichever system you look into, Kaiser, Sutter, uh, Stanford, and others, there is a huge demand for this. And I think one thing which I've started doing, and I don't know, Ellen, if you agree with me, is I said that because this is a common question I'm getting about uh, physical distress, emotional distress, and all of these that I say, at least speak about this to your primary care doctor, at least have that conversation. And, but, but finding therapists and providers, and this has been national, Paula. I mean, there has been a national mandate now that we are running really low on resources. Because I mean, you, know, you don't need me to tell you that, it's just happening. Ellen, what are your thoughts? No, it, it's, that's one of the hardest things to find are therapists, mental health providers who will accept mm -hmm. Medicare, um, Medi-Cal, and uh, if you find one, then you know it's a resource that gets it's uh, that gets booked up so quickly because there's so few of them. Um, yeah. I agree that there are many primary care doctors who are equipped to handle, you know, some basic in mental health issues. But what I also heard from you, Paul, is that the primary care providers are also very booked up. Mm -hmm. They may be less booked up than some mental health providers, and they are certainly a start. You know, as part of primary care training, you do get um, some training on how to deal with the whole person of your patient, including their mental health. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if it's complicated therapy, they can't do it, but they could be a start, or they may have some um, connections. Uh, again, you know, I don't want to minimize mental health practitioners, but there, if you can't get in, you know, having some other way to community, you know, to connect with a support group, faith community. So many faith communities were providing um, weekly phone calls to you know to people at risk or uh, other ways to to reach out to try to combat the isolation. Because we know that physical symptoms arose out of the stress and the anxiety mm -hmm. and the depression, but uh, I think sharing resources. Uh, uh, people who accept it, they're really hard to find the mental health. Okay, providers. that's something as we move forward into our next sessions, we can try and snowball and ask mm -hmm. people on resources and then kind of create these lists. The other question that's related is, so we have the caregiver at home caregiving with the person who's starting to have agitation or behavioral changes due to their cognitive decline. And they haven't yet had um, so many people say that we know it's dementia, but we never got our person tested but now I need to take control of the finances. So I now I need to do the testing to get the letters to verify. And they are now stuck because those appointments are also delayed. So what are some creative ways to get your person tested if the neurologist at your provider, Sutter, Kaiser, 
it's not available for, for three to six months and you have to get control of your finances. Um, do you folks know of people who do private testing for cognitive? Go ahead, Tenen. I, um, I will say I do. I don't know how backed up they are during, um, because of COVID. Um, many of them, you know, and I don't know, so I, I, I can't say for sure what they, how available they are now, but there are um, uh, geropsychologists, neuropsychologists who are doing okay. assessment. So and that is a list of resources we can brainstorm and make, they make available to the participants. The only one I know of to everybody listening that is absolutely free and is, is through a research center. So it's not a clinic, but it's all the same testing and they don't send the results to your um, insurance companies. They just give it to the family or the legal guardian is the wonderful Stanford VA Alzheimer's Research Center that's online. You can call them and that's the one I've heard the most success with people who are being told by the regular health providers that, that there's a delay in the testing. So I've heard that the Stanford VA Alzheimer's Research Center is still getting people in within a, a few weeks, which is pretty amazing. But that is the only one I know of right now. Um, all right, so let's kind of see, and Kat, if you're on, what other kind of questions we're, we're getting. Um, I know if Rita had it and answered, did you, if you um, know of any. Same thing, Ellen. I do know of a couple of you know, neuropsychologists who are private are doing some of the testing. And, but, but again, they are getting booked up, but that is a system, that is a problem that, you know, and we will, we will look at some good resources to see if we can work on that. Okay, so we have 35 folks still on. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, and if not, I'm just looking in the chat line. I don't see any coming in new. Yeah, it looks like a pretty um, quiet group this morning afternoon, whatever, whatever it is at this moment. Middle of the day. So Kat, I just want to um, just ask Rita and Ellen, any other questions or about resources you want to recommend to people, reading materials for any of these topics, good books you've read recently. There are so many books on healthcare caregiving. Yeah, I mean, there are so many that come to mind and I think that, you know, it may be a good idea to create a list and submit it. You can send it to the, because most of what, what we were focusing on Paul, is that we have such a great informed audience as it is, but we wanted to make sure that we captured and Ellen and I have gone through countless of our, you know, the bulletins, the research journals that are coming out. How has life changed in this pandemic? And I think how is how are we able to take charge of our own health navigation? And that's the part that you know we are focusing. But we'll be happy to come back with a few good, you know, reading uh, some books or. You know, right. Books. I mean, yeah, I, because this is a really um, important time. Be you know whether it's through um, healthcare legislation coming out of Washington that caregivers are really starting to come more to the forefront. That they are starting their worth. Um, how much time and uh, money sort of is invested in their role as caregivers. It's, it's really is this almost tipping point that I think it's starting to get recognized. Healthcare systems um, are starting to recognize that we've ignored the caregivers for too long and it's affecting both caregiver health and patient health. And um, so I don't have any books right now, but there's just, there is a lot of information out there I think there's going to be more and more out there in the coming year. Um, but so off the top of my head, I don't have any books, but let's come up with some reading because I really do think this is a critical time. Um, there are two, I'm just a 36 hour day. I'm noticing yes. so that was something that's been around forever. And it's an amazing sort of Bible about what it likes to it feels like to be a caregiver of someone with um, dementia. Mm -hmm. You know, that's around since I was in training and I'm, I'm you know, it's been a lot, many, many decades, um, but it's a good book and it remains a good book. It's um, a good overview. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. Um, and it's used on Amazon for a dollar an hour, a dollar yeah. fifty, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty good overview. But there, there are so many um, books coming out there specific, like you've got Dementia Reimagined by, by Tia Powell and MD. Yeah, I mean, Tipa Snow, Snow is coming up with all this, um, 
right. uh, on new ways to think about dementia and, and, and really helpful tips on caregiving. Um, there, there's a lot out there. There's a couple, there's another question about the VA program you mentioned, Paula, you know, the Stanford, I'm sorry, the VA, um, where they're doing uh, neuropsychological testing. I don't believe you need to be a veteran, right? That's no, so, free to the public. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that was, that was from Judy. Well. Yeah. That question's from Judy. She's in the caregiver group. And Judy, we can talk about it, but several of the members of our group have, have already either had testing for their loved or for themselves. People are curious about their own baseline right now after the whole impact of the pandemic. So brave souls are going to have cognitive testing on themselves to get their own baseline, which is an so interesting Paula, yeah, talk. I just wanted to, based on that question about the 36 hour day that you know, Ellen and I will be talking about that because I think our, our, our experience with working with individuals, I mean, this is such a broad area, dementia. It can be, it can range from so, it, it can have such a vast range about the symptoms and who the person is and what is happening. So I think we want to look at it in a very creative, practical method and share some of our experiences that we are having, you know. So I think we will come back to that particular in that specific talk. And there was another chat question which said, when are you going to be talking about the nursing home placements? And I think that's the discharge session where we'll be taking some of our practical case studies and coming to you about what we have learned, you know, in terms of nursing homes. So, yeah, I think it's helpful for people to understand that skilled nursing facilities and our old concept of the nursing home or where we can age or an older person is going to be cared for and somehow Uncle Sam or there is funding that we're, that we are cared for that that now is totally a different uh, scenario and nursing homes are rehabilitation facilities Medicare will pay for so many days, but they're not necessarily the place where you go to live out your life. I think that that old fashioned concept of quote the home is over, you know, and I think people are still confused about that. Well, do we have any more questions at this point? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank for you the so much, Paula. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Form. And Kat, thank you.